Good morning, church. On behalf of the Life Point Praise Team, we'd like to welcome you to Life Point this morning. I am Sophia. We have Ariana, Juliet, and Jamila as our singers today. We have Mr. Robert and Elias on guitar, Patrick and Ben on drums and piano. And so we'd like to invite you to stand with us as we get ready for worship.
just as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasures you morning church will you guys please close your eyes and bow your head as we say prayer father god thank you for everyone here today and watching online thank you for bringing us all here safely and i just want to take a moment to praise your name god I know some people in here are really going through things, we all are, and I pray that you would just hold their hand through it all. And I pray that through that pain and everything they're going through, that they lean on you and that they grow in their relationship with you. And I pray, God, that you help us to know and realize how valuable we are to you. I don't think some of us know how truly valuable we are to you and how much we are valued. Jesus, you died for every single soul in this room, online, in the world. There was who is, who is to come. And that alone shows our value to you. Thank you. Father, we praise you for all the miracles that you have done. 5,000 people with a few loaves and some fish, with leftovers. 4,000 with a few loaves and some fish and leftovers. Lord, there is no doubt. There cannot be any doubt. Help us, Lord, to place our complete and full trust in you, Father. Help us to have that faith, that faith of a mustard seed. I thank you, Lord, for being here today. And I praise you, Father, for everything you've done for me, as well as all these people here today. I pray for an amazing Sabbath, Father, that the pastor's sermon really speaks to us today, and that we grow in our relationship with you, Lord, every day. And I pray this in your heavenly and holy name, Lord. Amen.
Is that better? There we go. There we go. All right. Good to be here this morning, and I just want to uh, thank uh, all of our youth for leading us out this morning. Can we share with them some love this morning once again? I can tell you uh, from experience, it's not easy being up front. Um, even till today, I still get a little bit anxious before coming up front and being in front of, of you all and, and our wonderful people online. Uh, so I want to thank them for their preparation and leading us out in, in worship this morning. Um, if you get a chance before you leave, please please encourage them and thank them um, because they, they are the church. Uh, today, we, we continue. We're on a two-part series of, of uh, a mini-series called For Everyone, and we started last week talking about why the gospel is for everyone, and today we're going to deepen that a little bit in understanding of God's grace. Um, before we step into that, um, how many of you have experienced random moments in your life? Random moments? Anyone experienced a random moment, a moment this morning? Anyone? Anyone brave enough to share? Oh, your hands went down. Is it embarrassing? Maybe? All right, it's about you then? Okay. Uh, ra random moments happen all the time, all the time, and, and, and sometimes they surprise us, sometimes they don't. I remember about five years ago, four years ago, uh, my two boys were, were playing in the backyard. I did not ask for permission for the story, but I'm, I'm sharing it anyway. Um, they were playing, we had something to play in the backyard, and um, and a couple of minutes had passed by, and there was a lot of silence, which made me very uncomfortable, right? Because you usually can hear them playing or fighting or celebrating or something, but I, I, I heard a lot of silence, which was random, right? Which is very random for them. And so uh, I go into the backyard, I step into the backyard, and I see something that's now even more random than the silence. Uh, my kids had managed to get a, a push dolly that we had kind of for infants, a blue one, um, I wish I brought up, went to brought a picture, but you, you have a good imagination. So they have this blue cart, like a little car that has this little handle in the back that you push, you put a, a, a toddler in it, you strap him up, and, and you can stroll him like a little car, and it and they had a little steering wheel, which was really, really cute when they were younger. But they no longer fit in that, and so they had taken that, they had gotten one of their tricycles and mounted it on top of that blue car and strapped it with the strap that belongs for the stroller on the first car. Now, that wasn't the most random part. <laughs> the most random part is that my youngest was sitting on top of the tricycle that's sitting on top of the blue cart, and the other one is pushing the blue cart with the tricycle and Mateo on top along the backyard. And I didn't know whether to congratulate them for their engineering success or to punish them. Like one of the two that were kind of in between the, the both of them. And then I was like, okay, this is, this is kind of a, a defining moment in their life. I'm just going to enjoy it. And so what I did is what every parent would do is I grabbed my phone and I took a picture. <laughs> took a picture because I wanted to make sure that I remember this moment in their life. That whenever they made it to NASA or whenever they made it to, I don't know, a, a car manufacturing plant, that that was the moment that defined their future, right? And there's a lot of random moments in life that we just think they're, they're just random, right? That, that moment had nothing to do with anything else in my life. That moment had nothing to do with who I am and my life, my trajectory. That's just a random moment. But what if the random moments weren't that random, but what if they were a defining moment in our lives? And, and what if we're missing the defining moments because we're labeling them as random? And so for us to have a better understanding of what a defining moment is, we're going to go ahead and put that on, on the screen. A defining moment is the point at which a situation is clearly seen to either start or change. It's a pivotal moment where things take a turn, where things go a different direction, where, where there was a transformation, a change that started, a revival that started, a new path that started, a new health approach that started, something that sparked something else to happen. And what if God was moving in your life to guide you to spaces and places where defining moments would occur? But what if we're too distracted and we understand a defining moment just to be a random moment? What if we just discard the moments that God has set up for us for there to be a deeper change or understanding about God and we just discard it to be just a random moment in our life? 
right? I've had moments in life where I was going through something and I grabbed the Bible and just randomly opened it at just any place and I read the scripture that I needed. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, there's some of you. Yeah, that's not embarrassing, right? Um, something, something that spoke to you. You were like, wow, that, that's so random, but was it? But what if there was more moments like that that God is setting up for us? We mentioned it last week that we are in an era of, of being distracted. We're, we're constantly distracted wherever we are. No matter what room you're in, no matter what place you're in, it's easily to be distracted. Like in, in the past, we would get distracted by just looking at people move, and that's how we get distracted. I, I remember one of my college teachers called me out one time, and he said, Ruben, I see that you're not. Uh, getting well with your classmates, like you're not getting along. And I said, why? He's like, you sit on the other side of the room. And I was like, but I like it there. <laughs> and I was like, do I need to sit with my classmates? And he's like, well, it's odd that you just, you and a couple others sit on the other side. And I was like, well, I, I like the window. <laughs> and he said, why do you like the window? I was like, well, first of all, when it gets stuffy in here, I get to open it a little bit. The second reason I didn't share with him, okay, I kind of lied. Second reason was that when I got bored in class, I could look out the window. Now we don't need windows to get distracted. I mean, we have devices that keep us distracted constantly. And many times we miss the moments, the defining moments that God has for us because we're distracted. Other times we're just, we're just too dumb. I mean numb or dumb. You, you get it, right? We've distracted ourselves to the point where we've created so many things in our calendar and our schedule that we no longer think. We don't want to think. We don't want to process. We don't want to review. We don't want to analyze. We don't want to soak too much in our mistakes or our failures because now we feel the gravity of sin, and we want to keep life going in motion. I was able to sit down with a friend this week that I haven't seen in a long time, and he's recently had about four or five people close to him that have died in the last two years. And so I, I, I sat down with him and I said, hey, how are, you, how are you doing, man? And he just went into his feelings and his family, his wife, and how they're processing death and how that's kind of shaken them. And I said, what are, what are you learning through all of this? He said, Reuben, the only thing I'm learning is that all the things that I thought were important are no longer important, and the things that I thought weren't so important are the most important. In other words, life and relationships, family, and you know, a walk with God seem to rise to the top when everything is being shaken, when we're, we're not being distracted, when we're done being numbed out or, or just dumbed down in life. We realize what's important or we can discover what's important and those defining moments that God begins to unpack our hearts and our lives. Another thing is that we can be disoriented. We, we don't know which direction to go. We're, we're, we're scared or we're afraid. We're lost. We're confused. And so defining moments come into our lives, and sometimes God brings them by force. But because we're so lost in life, we don't know if it's coming from God, if it's coming from the devil, if it's coming from the mother-in-law, if it's coming from the co-worker, the boss. We don't know where it's coming from. So what if God wanted to create a defining moment for you today? What if God not only wanted to create that, but what if it was already pre-orchestrated? What if God had already planned for you to be here today or be watching today because God was trying to set you up for something greater? What if it was not just for you, but what if it was for everyone? So today, the topic is, it's, it's, your, it's your moment. This is your time. God has pre-orchestrated something for you today, and we can find it in his word. And so if you have your Bible with you, we're turning to Matthew chapter 20. We're also going to see it on the screen in just a second. But just to set us up to have a better understanding of the text, in chapters 18 and 19 of the book of Matthew, we have these stories of Jesus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're four of the four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus. And Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. So we find a lot more uh, information in Matthew that has to do with gene Jesus' genealogy, his background, where he came from. It has a lot to do with Jewish thought and belief, with Jewish laws. And, and so before we get to 
Matthew chapter 20, we obviously have Matthew 18 and 19, and there's some interesting things that happen. For example, in Matthew chapter 18, the disciples come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, who's the greatest among us in the kingdom of God? So in your kingdom, which of us is the best? So down here on earth, Jesus, if you don't know, we kind of have this way of ranking each other, of kind of being able to see who has the most followers, who has the most influence, who has more power, who has more decision-making ability, who has more uh, wealth. So Jesus, in your kingdom, which of us has more followers? Who has more leverage? Who has more power? And Jesus goes into answering that question, and then they come back and say, Jesus, if... It, can anyone be divorced for any reason? That was random, right? How that progressed. And Jesus goes into that. And then there's some kids that want to be close to Jesus, and the disciples say, no, no, Jesus has no time for you, so get away. And Jesus addresses that, also kind of random. And then there's this young, rich ruler that comes up to Jesus, someone that had made it in life that was wealthy and smart and very religious. And he says, hey, Jesus, what do I have to do to make it to the kingdom of God? And Jesus goes into that. And when the disciples hear that a rich man's not making it into heaven, they say, well, Jesus, if he's not making it, who is making it? And when they hear the answer to that, they turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't know if you're taking score, but we have left everything for you. We left our families, we left our work, we left our homes, we left our communities, everything to follow you, so what do we get? And Jesus answers that. And they're all defining moments in the life of the disciples. There wasn't just one moment that changed the disciples and that Peter went from being this hard-headed, spontaneous individual to this loving, caring person that led the church. There was nothing that changed overnight for Thomas to stop doubting and fully believing. Uh, there's nothing for, you know, the sons of thunder to now be compassionate, empathetic all of a sudden. There's no change that happens overnight. And, and we've been talking about this this year, that spiritual growth is slow work. You can't just go to Amazon and Walmart and purchase it and have it. You can't own it. You, you have no control over it. You, you can't manipulate it. You can't force it. You, you just make small decisions every single day in the same direction. And through life, we learn to trust God in a deeper way. And the disciples were the same. Three years of following Jesus, three years of hearing Jesus say, one day I'm going to die, one day I'll be crucified, one day I won't be with you. And then it happened, and they were surprised. Like, they're like, where did this come from? This is random. Like, Jesus, why didn't you tell us you were going to die and leave us alone? And he's like, I've been telling you for three years. He kind of said it from the cross, right? I've been telling you for three years, and they ran away. And so they, they're asking these questions, wanting a better definition at life. And Jesus is saying, my work is a slow work. And if you're in it for the right reasons, you'll stick with me. If you want something fast and spontaneous, if you want something that's immediate, you're following the wrong person. But I'm going to do something in you that's not only slow, but I'm going to do it that's something beautiful something that will change your life from the inside out, and something that's not temporary, but something that's eternal. You see, there's, the, Jesus is the only one that offers us something that doesn't have an expiration date. G Jesus is the only one that offers us something that has more depth and beauty and value that we could ever accomplish or accumulate or gain in this life. And so Jesus goes into this story to help the disciples kind of understand kind of the crux of the gospel and, about, and everything that he is and so much more. And so we're going to read together. It's Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. And Jesus says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing, so he hired them, telling them that he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard, and at noon, again, at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some people uh, more, he saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? 
They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in the vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed that they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid those who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Isn't it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Shouldn't you, should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. Can seem like a random story, can seem like a weird story, but I, I want to extract two lessons from the story. The first one is that God is the one that makes the invitation. He is the landowner, he is the vineyard owner, he owns everything, and so therefore he has the right to invite anyone or everyone if he chooses to do so. The second lesson we can extract here is that there is a reward when we work for God. So let's focus on the first one. God invites us always to, to enter a relationship with him. We never seek God. We never look for God, we never desire God, we never want God. It's God the one that puts the desire, the want, it's God the one that looks for us and finds us exactly where we were. Shoot, I think if we wanted to find ourselves, we couldn't find us. Like, if we can't find ourselves, how are we gonna find God, right? And so God is always the one that's looking for us. And we find these stories, this evidence throughout the Bible, like God is the one that approached Abraham and said, Abraham, I need you to leave your home. I need you to leave everything you know and follow me. I'm going to make you a great father. I'm going to make you the first of a great, great, great nation. And Abraham followed. We have the story of Moses, where God had kind of selected him to be this leader that would lead his people out of Egypt. Moses went a different route. God went and found him in the desert, prepared him, and brought him back into Egypt to lead his people out. God saw Moses multiple times. We have the story of Jesus and the disciples. Jesus called them one by one. There was one disciple that Jesus kind of didn't call, but kind of allowed. And Judas kind of tugged along for the ride, and, and, and we know the end of his story, which is drastic and devastating. But Jesus kind of sought him too. And then we have the story of Saul, who later became Paul, and he was kind of opposing Jesus' movement, and God found him and called him, and he followed. God is always calling. God is always calling you. He's always calling me. When I'm distracted, God is calling. When I'm numbing my mind out because I don't want to feel, I don't want to think, I don't want to process, God is calling. When I am lost and I don't know my way, I don't know how to find myself and find others, God is calling. Every moment of your day, every single second that goes through the day from the moment you wake up to you go to work, that you drive, that you eat, that you're with family, that you watch TV or you watch your phone, God is calling. It's interesting that we get upset sometimes when someone doesn't answer our call. Imagine if you called a hundred times and no one picked up every single day. It'd be devastating. It'd be frustrating. And saying, hey, I want to be with you. I want to connect with you. I want to talk to you. I want to problem solve with you. I, I want to feel with you. But, but you don't pick up. And he calls every hour, every day, every week, every year throughout your entire lifetime. God is always, always calling. And there's different callings that God makes. The first call that God makes is for salvation. God calls everyone to him because he has a plan to get us from where we are to where he is. And that process is called salvation where I accept Jesus into my heart and I start a walk, a relationship with him. That's the first call Jesus makes. But God also makes a second call. When I give my life to Jesus and I get baptized, I receive the Holy Spirit. 
Now, I don't receive the Holy Spirit to continue to live my life as I lived it before Jesus, but I receive the Holy Spirit now to live a new life, a new creation, a new perspective, new way of going through life. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is not just to have help or someone to walk with me, but it's to have purpose. You've been called by God to live in a relationship with him. You have also been called by God to live with purpose. Sometimes our purpose is not clear because we have blocked out the voice that God calls to bring clarity and direction. Sometimes our passions switch and move and sway And sometimes the things that we're most excited about have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. I just think of all the times that we've been excited because we saw a movie. Or all the times that we were excited because we saw a new TV show or something new on Netflix. Think of all the people that we told or we wanted to talk to about the thing we saw that could have been good and could have been fascinating and interesting and intriguing, but at the end of the day does not change my life whatsoever has no gravity over this life or the next life. How many times have we been excited over things that happens at work or things that happen in the marketplace, things that happen in Hollywood or things that happen anywhere else around the globe? How many times have you been excited for what Jesus is doing in your heart? How many times have you been excited to say, you know what, I, I, I get to wake up today and, and I can call to my Father in heaven who's calling me and waiting for me to talk to him. Like how many times have we been excited when we have someone that's going through a problem, a need, a sickness, and we get excited that we get to call our Father in heaven that can help beyond understanding to that person in need. Like do we get excited about God as much or more than we get excited about our sports team or about our show or about what we're reading or about what's happening in our professional life? Maybe we get more excited about these other things because we have stopped hearing God's call in our life. Maybe we stop getting excited about God because we don't see him moving around us. And maybe we stop getting excited about God because we try to manipulate God to bless our lives and our direction, our plans, instead of aligning with his. See, God calls everyone. Everyone. He calls everyone to be saved, and he gives everyone a purpose. God has given you a purpose. Now, some of the traps with God's calling on purpose is that sometimes we like somebody else's calling better than ours. Am I speaking to anyone here? Like sometimes we get a little bit jealous that that God has given someone the calling that we wanted. (laughs) Like, God, I wanted that calling. I wanted that role. I wanted that responsibility. I wanted that gift. I wanted that talent. God, you know, I, I, I worked all day, but you're giving the best to the person that worked an hour. Right? And other times we get upset with God because we're praying for God to do something in our life and we know that someone else is praying for the same thing, but God seems to answer their prayer first and so now we want to be happy for them, but we're really not because we didn't get what we were asking and they got it and we know that we go to church more than they do. We know that we've read more of Scripture. We know we pray more. We know we're better human beings. It's like, God, what's up with that? Like, God, I deserve it more. While God's calling is for everyone, he has not called us to compare our callings. And he also reminds us that we don't own the calling. Because the calling comes from him, all we can do is receive it. God is calling you on two fronts today. He's calling you to walk with him every single day, every moment of the day. And he's calling you to give you a purpose. Your purpose goes beyond your responsibilities with your family. Your purpose goes beyond your profession or your responsibilities in the workplace. Your calling goes beyond your expectations or someone else's expectations for your life. Your calling, our calling, is greater than ourselves because our calling comes from a king that's coming from a different kingdom. 
And so when we step into that calling, we're stepping into a different realm, into a different universe, into a different reality in how we navigate through life, in how we navigate through loss and circumstance, how we navigate through crisis and need. It's different because we know that our lives no longer belong to ourselves. They belong to him. Maybe what you're needing today and what I'm needing today is that defining moment where we're reminded that we are loved more than what we could imagine and that that person that loves us has a calling for our lives, has a purpose for our lives, that our lives matter, that there's value to who we are and who God is making us to be. The second point I want to share with you this morning is that there is a reward, and it's clear that there's a reward from the story, right? Everyone received a reward, and everyone received the same reward. Now, that can be challenging for us, right, that everyone received the same amount. That, that almost seems like communism, like, like how, how is everyone getting the same thing if we all didn't work the same amount of time, right? Like how would it feel in your workspace if the person that gets hired in December got paid as much as you that started in January? How many of you would be, just be a little bit upset? How many of you be excited? Mm, we got some. <laughs> How many of you have wished you would have started in December versus January, right? <laughs> it's challenging. And it's also not fair. It's not fair in human terms, right? Because we expect that if you work an hour, you get paid for an hour. That if you gave one, you get one. That if you put a certain amount of time in, that you're going to get something in, in return. That you're, it does not make sense to put in 10 bucks and get 5 bucks back. And that's kind of what it feels for the individuals that have worked all day. But the master is saying, it's not fair for you, but it's fair for me. You see, human love... It tends to give people what they deserve. In every relationship, we give people what they deserve. So I'm usually going to give back as much as I'm getting, right? We kind of do this when we give gifts. And if you didn't know about it, now you know. You got plenty of time till Christmas to, to figure it out. If someone gives me a brand new iPhone, which I don't need, if someone gives me a brand new iPhone and I gave them a t-shirt, it's going to feel a little bit awkward. I'm going to feel that what I received has a lot more value than what I gave. So most likely at the next opportunity, I'm going to give something of the same value and hope that he gives me or she gives me a t-shirt like I did the first time to level things out. And even though it's a gift, we still feel that something's off. God says, your way of showing love and giving love is not the same way that I show and give love. You see, God doesn't give people what they deserve. God gives people what they need. The person that worked one hour needed a full day's wage to be able to have money to go to the market and buy food to feed their family. The person that worked all day needed one day's wages to go home to the market, buy bread, milk, and feed their family. They both needed the same amount. It doesn't matter how much time they worked, it's what they needed. And the owner of the vineyard knows exactly what they need before he even hired them to work in the vineyard. You see, before God calls you, he already knew what you needed. He knew what you needed before you realized you knew what you needed. And so his calling for your life is to meet the needs that you know of today and the needs that you don't know of tomorrow. And so when I'm walking with Jesus, he's automatically or live fulfilling the needs, not the wants, the needs of my heart in such a way that I don't even realize that my needs are being met. Now, if I think that the reward is about me and what I have done and what I have accomplished, then grace is not going to make sense. 
then grace is not fair or just. Then I don't want that type of king. I don't want that type of religion where I'm putting in all what I have and I get the same amount of the last person that walked in. But there's something that happens when we allow grace to come into our hearts and our lives. There's something that happens when we realize that even when we work the entire day, we still don't even deserve that day's wages. There's something that happens in our hearts when we realize that we deserve nothing from God, yet he gives us what we don't deserve, that our hearts become softened not only to our understanding of God, but more importantly to our understanding of each other. It changes the way I view God, it changes the, view, the way I view myself, and it changes the way I view the world. You see, God's grace has the power to define you. That you're not what you have accomplished, that you're not what you have amassed, that you are not how much money you have in your bank account or how far again you've gotten in your studies. You are not what people say you are. You're not what even you say about yourself. Grace says that you're loved more than you could ever understand and that God was willing to give you the best thing, especially when you didn't deserve it. When I realize that I don't deserve what God gives me, I am humbled to be in God's presence. I'm humbled to be called by God. I'm, I'm humbled to be able to share that with other people. You see, grace has also the power to change the way that I deal with other people. It has the power to change my marriage. When I realize that Jesus gave it all for me, I understand that God has asked me also to give myself away to my spouse or to my children or those that he has entrusted me. You see, when, when, when I allow grace change the way I live, my calling is not just confined to a church building or when I'm amongst people from the church, but my calling is also applied to my neighborhood. My calling is also applied to my work area, my workspace. My calling is also applied when I'm out in the market because God is calling me to live out my calling, not to confine it to one space. God's grace has a way of changing not only my life, but everyone's life around me when I let it flow through me. But when we feel entitled or we feel that we deserve certain things from God, we now become centered on self and God has to meet us where we are to do what we want him to do or he no longer is functional for who we are. You might be in a space today where you're thinking, you know what, I earned it. I've done the right thing all of my life. I've tried to live my life the best way possible. I've treated others fairly. I've been patient. I've been forgiving. I've gone the extra mile. God, you owe me. It might be that you have little or no experience with God's grace in your life because you just not, have not allowed God to fill your heart with his grace and love and forgiveness, and so you're, you're kind of pushing it away, and it's hard to accept. It's hard to give something you haven't accepted for yourself, and so you're judgmental and hard on yourself, and you're the same with others. Or maybe you've gotten to the point where you think you've done good enough and that you're better than everyone else, and so you deserve God's favors, and God needs to bless you more than others because you deserve it, and they don't. In church, that's called hypocrisy. Think that God only exists to serve our needs, our wants, our desires, our focus, our plans, our direction, and no one else's. God didn't come to the world just to serve you and save you and bless you. He came for everyone. There's a quote from Ellen White, Christian Adventist author and founder, and she says the following in Christ Object Lessons, chapter 28. She says, there no amount of labor performed or its visible results but the spirit in which the work is done make it of value with God. You could do a little, but with the right spirit, and that is value of God. You could do a lot with the bad spirit, and it's no value of God. And it's not our spirit that makes the difference, it's his spirit. It's not our desires that influence someone else to come closer to him but it's his presence in our lives and it and it's slow work 
because there's so much inside of me that's wrong. There's so much inside of me that's rotten. There's so much inside of me that's going in opposite direction to God that every moment I need to submit to God and submit the thoughts, submit the feeling, submit the decisions, submit the plan, submit my relationships, submit my community to God and say, God, I just need you to do my will in your life. And when we start going in that direction and making those small decisions, those small defining moments that begin to shape our lives and our hearts, they, they lead us to a place of answering one question over and over again throughout our lives. Is Jesus enough? For the one that worked 12 hours, and he got a full measure of Jesus that day as a reward. Is Jesus enough for my 12 hours of work? For the one that just worked one hour and received a full measure of Jesus, is it enough for him or her? If Jesus is not enough for me, then there'll always be discontent in my heart. There'll be always something missing. I'll be always chasing something else. I'll be chasing another zero in the bank account, I'll be chasing another job, another relationship, another event, another experience, but still feel the same emptiness inside. So today can be a defining moment if we begin to answer that question, is Jesus enough for this moment in your life, for this moment right now? Is Jesus enough? If you want to experience his grace, you don't have to perform anything for him. You don't have to do a song and dance. You don't have to force anything. You don't have to lie to him. You don't have to manipulate the situation. All you do, all we do is let go of whatever is in the way right now, we just let go whatever thought or whatever emotion, whatever thing from the past, we just let go. And we say, Jesus, I want you to be enough. I want you to define this moment. I don't want to be a random moment. I came to church where I watched online. I just don't want to be random. I, I wanted to define my day today. I wanted to define this moment. And as we pray today, you'll have a moment to speak to Jesus. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. And say, Jesus, I want you to be enough. Jesus, I, I want you to teach me about what grace is and why I don't deserve it, yet what, why you give it freely. And if you ask Jesus to do that because he's calling, <laughs> he's going to show up. And he won't let you down. It'll be better than what you ever expected. It'll be deeper than anything you've experienced. And it'll be more powerful than anything you've felt in your entire life. There's a text in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, which says the following, and we'll pray right after that. It says, this is, the Lord, this is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they are truly that they truly know me, understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, which art in heaven, we thank you today that, that you are enough. We thank you today, Father, for calling us calling us exactly the moment where we were, where we were lost, confused, and lost in sin and pain and need and crisis, you called us. And in our darkest moment, in our scariest moment, in our weakest moment, you loved us. You loved us with an unconditional love that was so deep and so wide, not comprehensible to human beings until we saw Jesus come to earth and to give his life for us at the cross. So as we just meditate on the cross for one moment here, Father, we pray that our hearts may be softened to accept that Jesus died for us, that Jesus died for my sin, for my shortcoming, for my mistake, for my selfishness, for my pride. And he not only died, but he rose 
to give me hope, to bring love and forgiveness and direction to not just my life or our lives, but to everyone's life. So we thank you, Father, that you sent the Holy Spirit to all of us to give us purpose and direction, to remind us that Jesus is not only enough, he's more than enough. He's more than what we could ask for or desire or want or ever dream of. So in this moment, Father, we just want to pause. And I just want to give all of us an opportunity to open our hearts to you. If today you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can pray this prayer with me in your heart and say, Jesus, I'm not enough. Jesus, I have fallen short of the mark. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need of your grace today. Please be enough. Please be enough. Amen. Church, I invite you to stand and sing with us as we praise God and we thank him for all the blessings and mercy that he gives us every day. with us. 